multiple behavior. And when it's multiple behavior, it's a degenerate behavior. So finally, adaptability is very close to another concept that you might already know, which is decision making. When we decide to be stable or to be flexible, in fact, we are adaptive. So adaptability is more stability when it's needed and flexibility when it's needed. And the difficulty is to decide when to adjust <coughs> to a perturbation or to decide to adapt to this perturbation. This decision is not located in, your, in our brain, so we don't really decide if we want or if we don't want to adapt, we just experience it. That's my position or my background in the ecological dynamics framework. So to, to make it easy to understand, I use this uh, nice uh, schema from um, a neuroscientist, uh, not me, working in neuroanatomy and using or studying this concept of degeneracy in neuroanatomy, so with neurons. What they are saying is uh, to achieve this uh, function, finally we can have different neurons to do it. One neuron could achieve it if it is main function, but some other neurons who, which are not uh, dedicated to do it can attack what they do to achieve the same function. So finally, degeneracy is just kind of multi-stability. It means multiple structures can achieve the same function. So you can use those different pens to write A, B, C, D, A, G. So multiple structures, so the, the key word is multiple or many structures, many coordinated structures to achieve one function. So the relationship is described as many structures for one function relationship. It's quite straightforward to understand. So if we translate it to sports, we want the structural variability of our behavior being adaptive when there is a stability in the performance outcome. So if the function is to grasp a hold in climbing, we want to achieve this grasping action by different ways. So different structure of coordination, different type of grasping, a pinch, a crimp, uh, whatever. But then to be, for instance, to keep our speed, to keep our fluency, or to climb frequently or to climb quickly. But in fact, we are not always varying in structure. We can also vary in function, which means that for one structure, we can achieve an obvious function dedicated to a pen, so to write or to draw. But sometimes we can see people using a structure for an unexpected function, like to attach your hair. And that's what we define as innovation or creativity. So in that kind of relationship, we are with one structure for many functions. So again, what's those kind of studies in neurosciences uh, suggest is to develop pluripotentiality or multifunctionality, we must first <coughs> develop degeneracy because this is the support to be creative. So what we want in, uh, in fact, in the climbers, it's to enlarge their repertoire, not only in terms of uh, behavioral patterns, but also in terms of functions. So for one pattern to be able to enlarge the functions that this pattern can achieve. Okay, come back to, in practice, What's happened in climbing? What's happened? So, as I told you, I am with this uh, ecological dynamic framework that we we built with some colleagues like Keith Davids in the, in the UK, Duarte Arujo in the Lisbon, and uh, Jai Shaw in Singapore, uh, Chris Button in New Zealand. We are a group of people trying to bridge uh, dynamic system theory in physics and ecological uh, uh, psychology to, to, to build this big framework to understand how a set of constraints, so the past constraints, like uh, 
climbing uh, a certain uh, inclination of wall, like uh, climbing indoor or outdoor. And the organism constraints, like uh, if you are a tall guy or a small guy, if you have a big flexibility or if you have a, a lot of uh, strength, and how those constraints interact and make emerge a certain perception action to him. So how I perceive the old, how I perceive the distance between all, how I perceive the shape of those old, and finally, how I perceive my uh, the opportunities for actions that we call affordances. So how the world afford to me to climb in a certain way and to decide for certain behavioral patterns. And during actions, I might change the way I climb. I might adjust my grasping pattern. I might decide for reaching or not reaching that goal. So change my path. And that's why I, that's what I'm, I'm investigating in my research. How climbers perceive an act, an update perceive an act. And I study this loop to finally understand how they coordinate their movement to achieve the goal. So the goal could be to, to climb hard, to climb fast, to climb fluently. But in all cases, I don't look only at the goal achievement, but how they adapt when we change the difficulty of the route, the shape of the hole, all the constraints that can vary when we do climbing. You have some examples of how people have to adapt and transfer their skills when they climb indoor or outdoor, when they climb steep bouldering or reclimbing as the last uh, uh, Olympic Games in Tokyo. You see the, the, how the ranking change through the, the competition. If you, so if you climb indoor or outdoor, if you climb a rock, ice, or mixed wood, or so all, all these different environments are different uh, constraints that you have to cope with. The way we approach this, uh, so the way the pedagogical way we approach this set of constraints is not by uh, prescribing what to do. So we don't instruct people to do like this in this kind of constraints. We are more with a constraints, with, with a constraints led approach. It means we manipulate the constraints that make emerge the behavior. So we, we think that by changing the constraints, by shaping the environment, we induce a new behavior. So we try to, to put the learner out of his comfort zone to discover and to explore what to do. And so finally to adapt to the task. So we, we try to predict the behavior that we don't want to see anymore, rather than to prescribe an expected behavior, which is a two different uh, position of, uh, in pedagogy. So we use the constraint-led approach to promote exploration, we call it functional exploration, <laughs> problem solving in practice and not in the brain, and search strategy. So all the, 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 the studies that I will present to you are with this background. So our adaptability is tested by manipulating the task constraints. First, my first study I did in uh, maybe eight years ago was about using uh, old orientation as a task constraints. So as you can see there, it's quite obvious that if you have to climb a ladder, you take the, the ring like this, the ring like this, few persons will took the side like this. So that way when a, a novice setters uh, set a route in a climbing gym, they usually put the, the hold like this, in this uh, orientation. But it's very poor in terms of um, to develop the, the, the learner. Then if you put the, so if you rotate 90 degrees, this all to put it like this, to set it like this, then it's more difficult for, for beginners because uh, being like this, it's okay, but being like this, it's not so easy. 
if you don't know how to put your body in a good posture. So what I try is to offer those two uh, task constraints. And then we know that in climbing, you have the risk of uh, falling. And uh, as a beginner, you can be afraid of uh, pain. So you might resist to climb in the sense the, the hole that invites you. So like this, feeling on time. So to promote a safe exploration of this pattern, I offer the possibility to have a dual grasping. So both uh, vertical and horizontal. But the way I set the foothold invites 80% of time this type of wrestling. And in case you, you don't find the solution, you can still have a, a kind of backup and to climb to, to rest the hole like this. So it's not 50 50 distribution, it's more like 8, 70 80% like this and 20 30% like this in terms of uh, invitation for actions. So for people who are not familiar with climbing, but I think you are more or less all familiar with climbing, if you are here, you know, uh, <coughs> like me, that uh, beginners are more in the face position to the wall, and we can uh, maybe compare it to the duck style, when you look at the, the feet position, like this. So it must, must like, mostly uh, like this which is not uh, really uh, efficient, um, except when the holes are all set in this, uh, in this way. But once the holes are like this, you can see that experienced climbers are more on the uh, front side, using the external and the internal <laughs> side of the climbing shoes. So they know already how to rotate with the feet, with the hand, with the shoulder, and finally with the whole body. So, I, I named this, uh, this mode of coordination the Cleopatra style, even if it's not exactly, exactly that. And my, my uh, research question was how the learner will understand and will explore this opportunity. And uh, as you know, exploration is not straightforward. You might have some uh, kind of um, try and come back. Um, just to um, invite you to think that it's not in our brain, but it's in our body. When I was uh, uh, in, during a climbing session uh, outside, I was uh, belaying my partner, and a worm was just near to me. And you can see nicely how he's exploring, so touching, but not moving forward. So sometimes he's moving forward, straight forward, but sometimes he's touching and looking for, searching for his way for his path before going forward. So to me, it was very clear that finally uh, novices are doing more, more or less the same. At some point, they are searching, exploring the solution. And when it's, it appears uh, uh, effective, they just go on. So to test this uh, hypothesis, we have uh, instruct the same participant to climb a route like this by using, so first, first condition was without any uh, informational constraints, and then we instruct to favor the facing mode or the body side mode. So to be face to the wall or side to the wall. Just to understand whether they are able to, to climb on side, face, and how, it, how what they do when we we don't ask them any, uh, we don't require any mode of actions. Right. So this is the, the same climber. Here is the calibration because we use an uh, inertial measurement unit combining a gyroscope, accelerometer, magnetometer to then assess the body roll. So at the shoulder level and at the hip level. We also, uh, so the clap was to synchronize those, uh, this system with the, the video. Uh, this one is a bit slow. Yeah. 
So this is, you might try to see if he's very rolling his body to be side on the wall, to be face to the wall, and without any instruction. I don't. I don't know if you if you see the difference between the three uh, the three ways of climbing the same route. But to me, it was quite obvious that here he is able to be on side and using only the internal side of the shoes, like this on the walls. So if now I plot on this graph the distribution of the rolling motion of the hip, so zero degree face to the wall, plus 90 rolling the, the, the body on one side, the right side, minus 90 degrees, rolling, rolling the body motion to the opposite side. So this distribution shows you how they can vary depending on the route. So free, no instruction, when we instruct to be face to the wall and beside to the wall. And you can see that for one color is for one Climber. You can see that for some climbers, a, a, a quite a big difference between those three uh, patterns. For instance, here you can see a kind of bimodal distribution showing that they are no more facing the wall but really on side. But for some participants, probably they didn't understand the instruction because this guy, for instance, is rolling but only on one side. So always there is. And this one is doing the inverse, always goes like this. So probably they, they didn't really understand what was expected. And you can also see that some, some climbers, so for this dual uh, uh, route, uh, it's, it works quite well. But um, when, we don't, when we give no instruction, you can see that for some participants, it's more or less the same when distribution for the free and the face condition. So if we don't say anything to the learner, they are not able to uh, really demonstrate a large panel of behavior. So if we summarize, we have something like that. So the B model in the case of the vertical uh, distribution, when there is a dual grasping, no instruction, it's quite flat. And when we promote the horizontal one, obviously it's easy to do. So the distribution is more, more or less. So when we change the orientation of the hole, the root looks uh, look like this. So 20 holes, different colors, exactly the same, uh, the same root. I change only the orientation. So as I told you, I use this kind of uh, sensor. And then we assess what we call the jerk. So if you are not familiar with this measurement, the jerk is very interesting because it's a spatial temporal measurement. Not only spatial, not only temporal, but a spatial temporal measurement. And it's obtained from as the third derivative of the position. And roughly, it gives you the smoothness of the hip or the center of mass trajectory. So if we compare, for instance, those two conditions during four sessions of practice, of one hour of practice, six five per session, you can see that at the beginning, when the learner climb on the double edge route, they are very jerky, so not, not fluent. And on the horizontal one, they are already very smooth, probably because the horizontal type of wrestling is quite natural. And they don't really improve through practice. The good point is, okay, they are very jerky at the beginning, but they learn, they explore how to be more smooth. And finally, at the end of 
the learning, there is no more differences between those two rules, meaning that they learn to explore in an effective way. They learn to explore and to um, probably use the vertical uh, pattern of resting. Then we try to understand if when they improved the, the, the smoothness to so the frequency, it was only from for spatial or temporal reason. So as I told you, the jerk is spatial temporal measurement, but then it means they can stop a bit less or use the same path. And with the jerk, we don't know what they improve. So then we use a more known in the literature uh, index, which is called the uh, index of entropy. So it's a spatial entropy. Here is just uh, uh, from Sibella, an example to, to exemplify how we, we compute it. So if you have this convex rule, this envelope, and then you have two, two climbers, you can easily understand that this path is less complex, more structured, more organized, and that one, longer, for the same envelope, is more unorganized, less structured. So the entropy is higher for the blue one. Here is the sum of all the trials of the climbers during the four, se the four session, T1 to T4. And what you can see is both uh, low, less expert and more expert climbers improve with practice, let's say, the spatial fluency. And when we compare the horizontal, the vertical, and both types of grassing, you can see the horizontal one will invite more fluent behavior. And obviously, as a, as a more expert, you are more fluent than less expert. But interestingly, we have significant interaction between those effects. And as you can see, the more expert don't really improve with practice because the probably the route is too easy for them, whereas the less expert improve a lot from the first to the other uh, session. And when we look at the interaction between practice and wood, again, you can see that with the horizontal one, you succeed from the beginning of the session, but finally you don't improve through the learning, just because when you start easy, you finish easy. But if I set a problem, so the, the double edge route, you can see that finally you improve and you reach the same level of fluency than for the other routes. So it's just to tell you that if you set a route easily, you might see a quick improvement, but not uh, um, an enlargement of the behavioral repertoire. So if you want to promote exploration and people to enlarge their repertoire, it might be more interesting to set problems and probably if you want them to recover to alternate problems and easy path and problems and easy path, what we call a crux. So if you have an unbalanced distribution of difficulty, it might be good rather than a constant difficulty. So for people uh, familiar with uh, skill acquisition, you might know that through uh, what we call variable practice instead of constant practice. So to distribute the difficulty in time. Then we try to go a step uh, further because uh, with this kind of data, we have only a, a broad overview of the fluency, but not exactly the different types of uh, behavior. So with, my, with some colleagues, we try to use the sensors to distinguish different modes of action based on if the hip is moving and if the limb are moving. So when both are immobile, we call this immobility. When the limb is moving, the, are moving at least one, and when the hip is immobile, 
we could uh, just call the direction like doing that. When the limbs are immobile and when the hip is moving like this, like dancing, we call that uh, postural regulation. And finally, when everything is moving, we call that traction. When we will go up. And using this basic decision tree that which is summarized here, then we try to uh, so again, this is where we, as we put, we set the sensors on the participants. Then we try to detect motion and immobility. That's why it's a zero versus one, because we put a threshold. And when we combine the right foot, left foot, hip, right hand, left hand, then we have the wall, so the, tap, the summary is there. And you can see on the video, how the, the climber is uh, switching from one mode of action to another mode of actions. So we can see through the route and show him how he's doing that. And finally, in time, we have the distribution of the different modes. So how long do you spend in mobile? How long do you spend to regulate your posture? How long do you spend to interact with the hole? How long do you spend to go upward? Again, as I'm interested in learning, I did a pre-test. So top left, top left is a pre-test for one participant. You will be more interested by the summary uh, graph. In red is what we call uh, what I call exploration. So one is old interaction. So when a hold is touched, grasped, but not used to go across, so not associated to a hip motion. And so that's for the horizontal hold resting, and that's for the dual resting hold. You can see a lot more of exploration as we expected for the dual resting hold. And when we look at the post test, you can see that this learner is decreasing the number of exploratory actions. So it's more performatory than exploratory actions. It means instead of touching and releasing the ball, is touching and then grasping, which is of very of interest because you know that in lead climbing, the judge how to estimate if when a, a climber is falling, is just touch, control, or use the hole. That's one way to, to distinguish, uh, to separate the competitor. And when we look at the post test for this route, you can see that the number of exploration is still very high. So with this route, is not decreasing the number of exploratory actions, which means that this kind of exploration is very effective now. Because if you remember, I told you that the fluency on those two routes becomes the same at the end of the learning. So if it takes you the same time to climb this route, if you have the same fluency to climb those two routes, but if you explore more, it might mean that the way you explore becomes more effective. So we don't want to learn, we don't want learners to explore less. We just want them to explore in a more effective way which is very interesting to adapt to uncertainty. I might skip that one. This is um, the summary to move on for the last five minutes to visual motor skills. So if you know about uh, how to study uh, vision, you might know that we use uh, gases able to, cap to capture and the gaze behavior, and then to get the point of gaze. So the projection on the wall or on the, the environment of what you are looking. And depending on the time you are looking at the same place, we call it a fixation. The so fixation is defined in space from time. So in climbing, my interest, my first interest was to understand is when you are looking 
somewhere in the world, it's within your action system boundary that you can define quite easily by the arm span, so what you can reach with your uh, arm and with your legs. So we, we, can be, we can draw a kind of uh, envelope, which is the reaching area that you have. And then if we track the VIP, so this is a, a light that we use uh, on the helmet for biker. So we attach the light to the harness and we track it. Uh, so that's the red line. So that's the the motion of the of the hip, and this is the envelope defining your uh, action system boundary. Each time you have a a green dot, it means you are watching within this envelope, and each time you have a yellow dot, it means the climber is watching outside of this envelope. So we want to understand if when you look outside of this envelope, you are predicting the, the path, the climbing path, or whether finally you, you just scan randomly because you don't know where to go. So is it fruitful to look out of your action boundaries or is it finally uh, useless? So we, here you have a, a comparison between a less experienced climber and a more experienced climber. And interestingly, you can see what I already showed you. So a high entropy of the climbing path and a more smooth, uh, uh, more fluent climbing path which is associated to a more direct, linear uh, scanning uh, path or visual path. And here we could uh, characterize this um, visual pattern like a zigzag pattern. So zigzag means uh, up and down, or right and left, and more random, more go and come back, which is associated to the very complex so with reversal point in the hip displacement. The second study we try to, to do is um, if we offer or if we design the route with very regular hold, so always the same hold, two types, round one, square one. And if in counterpart we use very different holds, how the regularity of the, the environment is perceived and used. So this is, there are the two rules. You can see the, the path is the same, just that we use a regular one or irregular one. And what we observe is when we compare those two routes, in fact, it was quite unexpected result because if I told you something is irregular, you might believe that you explore more because the irregularity. And when it's more redundant and more regular, you might explore less because they all are repetitive. So you might expect the same pattern. The thing is with the, when the route is the same or when the holes are the same all along the, the ascent, in fact, you, you might uh, sometimes, just because the orientation is different, I must tell you that we changed the orientation. The orientation was not always the same. Then you have to cope with only a narrow possibility of grasping. So if you know that the good edge is here, if I set the hole like this, it could be only on the wrong. But if now this hole is like this, you can only grasp it on the right. So once you know how to grasp this hole, then you have no other choices. Whereas with those type of holes, finally you can always adapt. So what we what we observe is finally with the regular one, because you offer less possibilities of actions, you have to explore more how to grasp them, which is a bit counterintuitive. 
So that's why here you have, uh, in terms of duration, uh, higher duration for the yellow uh, one than the, the, the white one, both for the preview and the, and the plan. And if we look at the number of fixation, so the number that the number of times that you fixate uh, an area of interest, the number of fixation you can see there is higher for the regular route than for the irregular route, both for the preview and for the plan. So again, it's not because the route is more regular that it's easier. It's just that you have to cope with how to grasp the same hole, but in a different way, which is, a, again, an issue. It invites people to, to set hold in a very various way using different uh, types of hold. And if you are aware about how competition are set, you know that now we use macro volumes because that kind of hold offer a lot of possibilities of actions. And to finish my presentation, this is just what you can observe during a preview. So higher is the area, longer is the fixation. On the left, you have an experienced climber. On the right, you have a less experienced climber. What is interesting? What do you see on the experience that you don't see on the less experience? What is different? The experienced climber is looking much more further. Yes. And the time, the time is the same, in fact. <laughs> You can see that he has quite he already finished to preview and he's still uh, looking uh, over here. So, yeah, what else? But he's moving and so he's really already checking in his mind if he can. The external chamber is engaging physically in the preview, doing simulation, watching the world with different perspectives to see the shape and to see opportunities of action. So, what Previewing is not only in our mind, it's not only in our brain, it's not only visual. Previewing is a visual motor skill. Because we are already simulating, we are already planning what to do, we are watching the, the, the hold in different ways. As a less experienced climbers, you don't know what to, to look at. So probably you are looking at um, the wall distribution of the hold the big one, stuff like that. And if you try to understand how previewing is, is made, you can distinguish, so we base our uh, decision tree on the Grish School and Leonard uh, study to distinguish different uh, visual search strategy. So a new scan, scanning the whole route, fragmentary strategy, when you switch from one section to another section, but it could be also uh, very uh, linear. We call that ascending strategy, linear. It could be zigzagging, I already told you. So up and down, up and down. And it could be a block strategy. So when fixations are always at the same, more or less at the same place. Usually we observe this kind of uh, strategy when there is a crux in the route. So here, is an example of uh, five scans for the same participant. First is watching all the route, and finally, at the last scan, you can see that he's focusing only on the turn section. And here, it showed you that when you set a route of uh, here, it's uh, 11 meters high, the heat map showed that this is the part where the learners focus on. And on the top, after seven meters high, it's too far away to see how to, to predict how to climb. So there is less fixation on the top of the route. So imagine in competition when you are 15, 17, 
meter high. If you don't have binocular or if you if you can't really predict what is uh, on the top, then you must be adaptive. You must be adaptive. You can learn the whole if you know them in advance. You can recognize them, but you can still uh, miss something. So if you train learners only with instruction, never with adaptation, you might you might miss the goal of uh, education. And I go to my conclusion. So. Less expert climbers are characterized by more exploratory behavior, both in root finding, hold grasping, and range of actions on body posture. Longer climbing duration, more jerky, so less fluent, and various climbing paths. More stationary period dedicated to visual search. Vision is used for dual purpose, prospective control, and online control. Preview is random with zigzag pattern. And conversely, expert climbers still continue to explore, but more effectively, as they are able to visually and aptically perceive more opportunities for action, to chain action in a sequence, leading to more climbing fluency. Previewing is more structured, linear or fragmentary when easy, and blocked when the crux is detected. If I come back to pedagogy, the ecological dynamic framework proposed to educate to attention by using the constant set approach in order to develop functional exploration during learning. So, explore to learn in order to learn to explore. Thank you for your attention and I would like to give a special thanks to my uh, collaborators.